Aloha Awinala, I'm Kaui Lucas, and this is Hawaii is my mainland, live streamed Fridays at 3 p.m., keeping it on the bright side and off the grid. Manu Oku, the official bird of the city and county of Honolulu, is being celebrated next week, Saturday, May 20th, at the second annual Manu Oku Festival. With me to talk about these beautiful winged acrobats are Ashin Siddiqui, Seabird and Waterbird Coordinator with the Division of Forestry and Wildlife at the Department of Land and Natural Resources. Benton Kale Ipeng, PhD Biologist, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and Joni Peters, Coordinator of the Manuoku Festival and Administrator for the Conservation Council for Hawaii. Ano ai kako. Mahalo, Mahalo for allowing us to be here. So, Last year was so much fun. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing really, Joni. Yes, really. it was, yes, it was that's the correct. first one. Right. But now we're all a little more relaxed because it was such a good time. I know, and it was really popular and well received in the community. So give us some of the basic details. What is it? So this year we're having it at the Iolani Palace grounds at the Coronation Lawn, um, right outside of the Iolani Palace, where it will be on May 20th and it will be from 11 to 3 o'clock. And we will be having two very big craft and activity tents with 24 um, partners. And people will be able to do crafts, games, and just learn about the Mano Oku. Um, we'll also be having tours, Mano Oku tours. We'll be having a scope. They will try to, be, um, they will try to scope a chick so that people can come up and look at a live check. Um, we're also having some characters, some costume character characters mm. from Metagold. I'm sure you all remember Lani Mu. Yeah. Well, Lani Mu will be there. Um, also with Kavika Mu. <laughs> <laughs> we're also having a, um, a costume character come from the mainland from National Wildlife Federation. His name is um, Ranger Rick, and so we'll have a lot of um, fun things for the kids. Yeah, um, we'll have free entertainment. We have snacks. We have a costume contest. So I hope everybody um, dresses up. It's a nature costume contest. That was one of the surprise, really amazing things. Um, people did just incredible things um, making costumes. There was this um, toddler that was in a. Um, maybe we'll see the picture of it. Uh, an, an octopus, a tie-dye <laughs> octopus. <laughs> <laughs> so cute, and then these two little, uh, two little bugs, and then um, Michelle Schwenkela, whose artwork was in the um, the Honolulu Biennial. She crocheted a Manuoku with a fish in its mouth, wow. and made a. a, a <laughs> <laughs> very um, cute, very, very cute. cute. Very cute. She and her son have it, so we never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But so Manu Oku, these birds, why why did they get chosen? Do you know, Kili? Well, I think what spurred it on was uh, 2007, uh, the mayor, Mufi Hanuman, established a proclamation recognizing the Manu Oku, the white tern, as the official bird of Honolulu. Up to that time, it was recognized by the Fish and Wildlife Service being protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It was recognized by the state of Hawaii as a threatened bird. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a unique bird that only um, mainly exists in the main Hawaiian Islands, only on Oahu, and right now the southern part um, of Oahu. Um, and so it had a special significance to the county of Honolulu. And I think Mayor Mufi Hanneman recognizing that, and with efforts of Conservation Council for Hawaii and some biologists, um, were able to um, help uh, write up a proclamation recognizing the bird. Uh, culturally, we know the bird is important to navigators. When mm -hmm. the bird goes out to search for food, navigators from offshore an island can see that, and it will point them in the direction of where the bird's coming from. And as the bird flies back to feed its young with the food in its mouth, the navigators, too, can follow the bird back to and find the island uh, where, where those birds are nesting. But these birds migrate. You said they're migratory. So yes. how far do they go? Are well, they in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, they're found on um, many of the islands, Midway, for example, uh, Lay San, um, most of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, that you find many white terns there. And, but in the main Hawaiian Islands, from Kauai to Hawaii Island, we only find them on Oahu, which is kind of unusual. 
Um, we have about 700 birds um, that were found in, in a study in 2003, and about 75% of those birds are all breeding. Um, they don't venture too far off the island. They only go uh, to find um, fish, and they come back to, to their nest and, and, and feed their chicks. Mm -hmm. um, so right now, in the main Hawaiian Islands, only Oahu, and, and mainly, again, the southern shore of Oahu, doesn't, it's not found past uh, Hickam Air Force Base to the west, and it's not found um, eastward past New Valley. So kind of a, a restricted um, area where you find the white turn um, in the main Hawaiian Islands. But in the northwest Hawaiian Islands, they're, they're all over the place. For, but for us, living on the main Hawaiian Islands, if you want to see them, you're only going to see them mainly in downtown Honolulu, Kapi'olani Park, um, parts of New Valley. I, I live in New, so I, I get to uh, see them. You're familiar with them. <laughs> I, they're one of my, my uh, annual markers. So, But you say they lived here full time? I thought they just came back from nesting. They, I they, only see them part time. Yeah, they, they, they are here uh, throughout the year. Oh, okay. um, they primarily are nesting from January to April. Oh, Most cool. of the nesting, um, fledging is, is occurring in March. So we're just a little bit past the primary nesting season, but there have been observations of um, eggs and, and um, nesting chicks throughout the year, but most of it's const um, constricted in the beginning of the year. I guess we used the wrong word, didn't we? Nesting season. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's one, one key element um, that I forgot to mention is that another unique aspect of this bird is that it doesn't produce a traditional nest. It doesn't mm -hmm. go and get twigs or leaves of grass to form a nest. It lays its egg directly in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands on the ground in small trees, some man-made structures in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. And in on Oahu, because we have a lot of cats and mongoose and other predators, they're found in taller trees, kukui, mahogany, monkey pod. And the nest, the egg is laid directly onto the branch and balances there. And the mother or father is, um, is, is on top of that egg for anywhere from two to three months until the chick comes from uh, comes out of that egg and, and the chip will stay there on that branch so yes there is no traditional nest per se then the egg is um, bare right on on the branch and it, and it delicately balances on that branch until it's ready to hatch mm -hmm. that seems like a really a really fragile way to do reproduction uh, mm -hmm. what shape are these birds in um, as far as um, populations and what is their status? Um, yeah, so um, we just did a study that was completed in 2016, and so the population actually, from the last census we did, which was in 2002, has um, dramatically increased, actually, their population. So we have about 2,300 birds wow. right now. Yeah. That's quite a, quite a big difference. <laughs> so we had about 7, 700 in 2003 publication, mm -hmm. and now it's 2,300? 2,300, wow. of yeah. which wow. about 1,400 are breeding um, pairs. So. Um, so they're doing really well. well. Now, how do you know that? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> well, I personally did not go out and count all these birds, it, but we did have um, Eric Vanderwerf um, along with Rich Downs. They did a lot of the survey work with other mm -hmm. um, volunteers as well, helping out, and they counted all these birds. Well, how can they? They, they look so similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have a lot of markings where you could, I mean, they're all white, <laughs> the little black eyes, little black peak. Um, so how do, they, how do they know which bird is which? Or? So, they, so these birds will, um, generally they'll nest in the same tree. So they'll come back and they'll nest where they nested the previous year. And so when they're nesting, they're, they're there for quite some time because they're coming back, they're sitting on their eggs for, like uh, Benton said, about a month or so. And then um, once the chicks hatch, they're constantly going back and feeding the chicks every day. And so it's pretty easy to monitor. They're pretty conspicuous um, in terms of where they're going. Wow, that, that sounds like a lot of legroom to, to mm, track down those kind of numbers. But you also knew which ones were, were um, nest, part of nesting pairs, and, and, or whatever we call it, um, and which weren't. Mm -hmm. Um, how, how do how do you if it if the bird isn't going to which do they even when they're not taking care of young, do they do they go to particular trees or? Yeah, so the, the, um, yeah, they they just observe the behavior of the bird and then they recognize whether or not they're um, breeding that year or not. And so, the, and these birds will 
potential. Some of them nest once a year, but some of them nest up to three times a year. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So no, no wonder we got our numbers up. But that's incredible, really, given that. Oahu, they haven't been here a long time, I sort of exactly. remember from last year. Mm -hmm. The first sighting was in 1961 yeah. of a breeding pair at Coco Head, East, East Honolulu. So ever since the 1960s, there had been um, biologists with Audubon Society, volunteers, who had been tracking these birds. And then now we have this recent study um, to, to continue that, that work that started mm -hmm. in the 60s. But it's kind of unusual. In 1960 is when the first observations began here on Oahu, and it's the only place on the main Hawaiian Islands we know the white tern exists. And it's also interesting because the, the range hasn't really changed, even though the numbers have increased, but the density of the birds have changed. Yeah. Um, I know um, in just the years that I've been, where I've been four and a half years where I live now, and, and some years we have more pairs than others. This year we only have two pairs. Two years ago we had three pairs, but I guess, you know, things happen. And I don't know, how, what's the lifespan of the birds? Do I, does anybody know? The oldest one that we are aware of is 42 years old. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So they're a long way. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Do they have just one chick at a time? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, on the migratory part, so some of them are migratory and some of them aren't. I mean, I'm a little confused because you said they, they stay relatively close to home, wherever that is, but they're also a migratory bird. Well, they're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and they, they do migrate in terms of feeding, but I think their home is like the birds that are here in Honolulu, they stay here generally, but we do get birds from the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. In terms of how far they're going from here, we don't really know. Well, there, it's not like the uh, Kolea where it's got an annual track or, or mm -hmm. something like that. No, these birds are resident all year. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then besides um, the um, use as a, um, a trap for navigation, was there an, ever any other, you know, sort of cultural Use? mention no, for there, there isn't. outside of Hawaii? But, but maybe I should translate the name. So Manu Oku, mm -hmm. Manu is bird in Hawaiian. Um, Ku is one of the Hawaiian gods, as mm -hmm. usually recognized with fishing. Um, and so I think the, the name that the Hawaiians gave it is maybe is reflective of its, its ability to go out into the ocean, you know, fish for fish and, and come back. Um, other than that, and, and it's used by navigators, I'm not aware of any other cultural uses of the bird. Um, unlike other seabirds, which have other uses uh, for feathers, for, for, for different things. Manuoku, it pre seems to be in the literature only for navigational purposes. So because they weren't so were they here before i mean if the if it was in the traditional literature for navigation and then they were here in the 60s so they must maybe they were here before and then they yes. disappeared yes and they may have been found on other other, other main islands as well um during the time of the um, early Polynesians, um, and, and maybe there was a decline when, as more people inhabited the islands um, that could have occurred um but we're, we're, we're just not sure. There is, there is a, a big gap in, in the knowledge of um, the cultural uses of the, of the bird, a, as well as um, just as biology. You know, we have um, knowledge of some forest birds that, that go back to the 1800s. You know? um, but for this bird, um, for, for the main Hawaiian Islands, it, it's mainly found just on Oahu for some reason. Were the feathers used at all? This bird, we don't no. know that. It um, hasn't, hasn't been found. That, that type of information hasn't been found yet. Well, let's take a little break and then come back and learn more about these beauties. Okay.
Welcome back to Hawaii is my main love. I'm Kawi Lucas, and today I'm talking with Joni Peters, Kaylee Pang, and Afshin Siddiqui about next Saturday's Manu Oku Festival. And this be not just about the festival, about this beautiful um, bird. Mm -hmm. It's so delicate looking, and, and they they seem to often one sees them in pairs. Is there is that a, why is that? Well, they have a um, strong pair bond, um, so you'll see um, often two birds together, and then um, they're very good parents as well. So when the oh, when the chick is learning to fly, and um, they stay when they're juveniles and they can fly, they often stay with the adult um, for a couple months too. So you mm -hmm. often see three birds flying together, and so that's the the parents are teaching the little one how to fly, um, just. I live in the back of a valley, and um, so they spend a lot of time. And also, I work downtown, so oh, as you mentioned, you see them all over the place. Right? Yeah. Over the place right? mm -hmm. And they just, I was surprised when I heard that they eat fish because they seem to spend so much time having really a lot of fun just flying around and spinning cartwheels yeah. and stuff. Do we know anything about that? I mean, there's no fish up there. <laughs> 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 Why they are in the valley? That's a good question. Um, they well, they're seabirds, so they they do eat um, mainly. They eat goatfish or um, flying fish, and you'll see them coming as Benton was saying. They, uh, you know, coming back with fish in their mouth to feed their chicks, and they'll do this every day while their chick is um, being reared during that time period. Um, but they they're the trees that they're choosing are generally these large trees that they're able to fly in and out of easily and perhaps your valley has a lot of those types of trees that they like. I'm not sure. No, um, but the, the playing in the air thing um, that they um, seem to do, when you mm -hmm. see them downtown, that's, that care, I was just wondering, are they just having fun? Or I mean, we, we, we tend to think that animals don't spend a lot of time frolicking, but maybe <laughs> they do. I don't know. I don't know. Biologist <laughs> Kaylee Pig. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm enthralled by that too. Just watching them doing those acrobatics in the air, following mm -hmm. one another, mm -hmm. um, and even when I think they're landing on a branch, they just hover over the branch and they take off again, and 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 the other one's following it. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm a bot botanist by training, so I, I I learn what I know about the terms actually from Dr. Eric Vanderwerf. Um, um, but I, I am also um, mesmerized by the way they fly, and um, I, I sometimes you can hear 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 their call, which sounds like a small little graspy, a uh, raspy laugh. Um, yeah, wonderful birds. Thank you for putting. I, I have been trying all day to think of a way to describe the sound they make. Uh, yeah, <laughs> me too. It's like a raspy laugh, or you know, kind of like the Joker, that 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 that, that type of repetition. But it's mm -hmm. kind of raspy and very unique, and very different from a pigeon. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might mistake it for a white pigeon, but the way it flies and the way it sounds is is much different. Mm -hmm. Joni, back yes. to the um, the event on on Saturday. Um, I we have. We've been showing a few of the pictures. Um, so, the, um, what kind of activities do you know? We there were some amazing ones for for kids to um, to do last time. Can you can you yes. tell me what what we have this year? Yes, um, I know some of them. Uh, we will be making little um, little uh, monooku chicks, uh, and we out of pom-poms, and it's really cute. The kids love that. Um, we will also be having some games, relay games, um, where where the kids will be holding, or adults, will be holding a little branch with an egg, and you have to balance the egg, and it's a relay game. So that's one of the um, more exciting uh, games that we'll be having. Um, <clears throat> we'll also be having a game uh, that you will be trying to pick up little food and try to put it into a spot, just like how the Monoku adults try to feed their chicks the little fish that they gather. Um, so we have a lot of activities. Um, Metagold, as I mentioned earlier, will be having um, some type of relay game, and the exciting part of that is the kids will get a little treat, 
little cold treat from Medigo for participating in the game. So a lot of fun activities. So I think I read there were some, there were over 20 partners um, in this. I believe we have 24. Wow, that's for only the second time around for yes, um, yes. a we conservation had doubled event. Doubled what I we had last love year. This. Yes, Honolulu, yes. really the gathering place. Wow, yeah, you can see some of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, concert, talk a little bit about Conservation Council for Hawaii. Sure. Conservation Council for Hawaii is a nonprofit organization. We're over 60 years old, um, if I remember correctly, and uh, our main objection is to, our main goal is to preserve or protect the native um, species, both plant and animal, and or ecosystems for the future generations. That's our main goal, and we do that through things like this Mono Oku Festival, um, where we talk and educate about the bird, doing fun things for the bird. Um, we also do some policy work. So that's what we, we mainly do. And I we network with other organizations as well. I love that um, this isn't about selling anything. <laughs> And I love that it's free. Yes. It was such a nice atmosphere. Yes. It was kind of low tech in a way, mm -hmm. um, but then some fun high tech stuff like the, the viewing and, and learning about right. the way the scientists are learning about these. But um, having this be something that's really more about community having fun, learning. That's yeah. right, because it's open and free to the public. Um, everything is free. So yeah, come down. What are you, where are you suggesting people park? Um, downtown is hard to find parking, I think. But Iolani Palace will have some open parking. This, you know, street parking will be available. On Saturday, there should this be. Saturday, should be mm -hmm. good for street parking. You know, okay. and the post office has a parking oh, yeah, lot across a, the street. There we go. That's really yeah. easy. Or maybe yeah. uh, a Lee place if. That's if, right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Afshin, now that we know that we have 23 of these gorgeous little things, uh, 2,300 of them, um, is there, are they endangered of being unendangered? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can say they're doing well right now, and there, there are a number of reasons we think that they're doing well. Like? Um, so, like Benton had mentioned, that they're only found in downtown Honolulu, which is kind of odd. Like, seabird in downtown Honolulu and that's where they're thriving and so one of the things we think is that you know they're in these big trees around um, businesses that are probably doing some kind of rodent control you know for whatever reason hey. and the birds might be benefiting mm. from these types of actions um, and as well um, they're found you know even in like Waikiki they'll be in the median strip where the um, where the trees are growing and there might be less predators there because they are surrounded by this traffic area. So there are mm -hmm. less cats possibly there, less mongoose there. So these types of habitats may be okay for the species. Um, one of the issues that we are always concerned about is um, there's a lot of tree trimming that's occurring in mm -hmm. downtown Honolulu, which has been an issue. but. You know, if it's done correctly, it's actually, you know, the birds can benefit from the way um, trees are trimmed, if they're trimmed carefully here. I must say, I was walking down Richard Street yesterday, mm -hmm. and they were trimming the trees, oh. and, I, <laughs> and I was looking in the ground. And <laughs> yeah, and we're working, the state is, um, and with their partners are working with um, some of these tree trimming companies to I help to identify. I talked to the arborist, and he's like, no, we didn't see any of the birds. We looked, we checked, <laughs> yeah. so they know. <laughs> and and a lot of them love these birds, too, so it, it's, a, it, it's a good partnership in they some were, cases. There was one in the news recently that mm -hmm. was, does anybody know that story? Yeah, it, it was a state building downtown. Mm -hmm. um, you know, news talked about this, this pair of birds stopping an $8 million project. Um, so that was just March. And, and like I mentioned before, March is one of the prime seasons for, for, for the fledgling to come out and, and, and the eggs. So um, luckily, the, some people recognize this as a potential issue. I, I believe state got involved, um, our law enforcement got involved, and, and the contractor was able to just put a, put a, a stop for, for a short time until you know, the, the nest, um, the quote unquote nest was um, you know, 
left bear, you know, the, the fledgling would left and, and the pair um, mother and father also left. And then the construction can start again. So the, the tree aspect of it, I know that um, I'm also involved with the outdoor circle and so we, we pay a lot of attention to trees. Mm -hmm. And last year there was, um, there was um, some people talking about the trees. I hope, I hope they do this year also because that's uh, interesting that here in Hawaii that they're in trees, but in other places they, they nest on the ground, you said, Afshin, or was that? Yeah, they, they do. Northwest Hawaiian Islands, you can find them on the ground. You can find them in small shrubs and, and trees about the size of um, head, head height, you know, five, six feet tall. But in Honolulu, it's much, much taller. And it's be <coughs> excuse me, it's because of predators. Um, we don't have, uh, Northwestern Hawaiian Islands don't have um, rats and mongoose. Yeah. And so the birds can be close to the ground. And, and other seabirds are there a as well. Um, but in Honolulu, even though we have a thriving uh, tern population here, they're still threatened by some of the uh, feral cats you see around, rats that, you, that come out at nighttime. Um, but uh, I, I'm glad to hear that the, the population is doing so well. So um, a few years back, I happened to be walking through the palace grounds. Um, one of the chicks had fallen down, and somebody knew who to call. Um, do any of you happen to know who to call now? Yeah, so actually there is a uh, Hui Manoaku um, citizen science project, and actually there's a person named Richard Downs who's been an amazing um, volunteer or organizer of this Hui, and he is um, a person who would be the best person to how, respond. So how does someone um, get in touch with him? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we have some um, pamphlets, but I have his phone number I can share. Yeah, sure, please yeah, do, please do. I should find it. Um, but yeah, it, he would be the first person to call. So because Hui the, Manu Oku, Oku. maybe mm -hmm. people can Google Hui Manu Oku. Yeah, there is exactly. a website. There is a website, and his number is 410-972-1818, and his name is Rich Downs. And the, the reason why we want to call him first, because he is able to hopefully um, put the chick back in its um, nesting tree so that um, the parents will come back and feed it and it'll have a you know, normal life and fledge mm -hmm. normally. Because otherwise, and we have, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for the chick to survive if we have to try to rehabilitate it and if it's taken away from where mm -hmm. it's naturally found. So the, the first response is we want to take it back to exactly it's, the tree it's that it's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. been found in. Well, thank you all for coming here uh, down to our studio, Think Tech Studio today, and talking about this. Um, I hope I will see you at least, yes. Joni. Uh, next Saturday at the Iolani Palace. Um, thanks for sharing your manao, both of you, all of you. Um, aloha. Aloha. aloha.